Okay, so we are now going to talk about linked genes. This is, and of course I forgot to start my pen again. This is chapter seven. And, oops. So linked genes means genes that are physically close on the chromosome. So we have been looking at independent assortment and genes on different chromosomes. And you can also get independent assortment with genes on the same chromosome as long as they're not linked. So as long as they're far enough apart for crossing over to happen at the expected frequency. So what this slide is showing you is that with linked genes, when they are so close together, there's a smaller chance that crossing over can actually happen between this big space as compared to, say, gene C. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> gene C here, where between C and B, you have a lot of room for crossing over. So this is what we've normally been looking at, independent assortment of the different genes. So again, when you have genes that are very close together, you don't get as much crossing over. You will still get the same types of gametes produced that we've talked about, but instead of a one to one to one ratio, the recombinants are much less than one. Okay, so they're gonna be at a lower frequency. And this is a new term, recombinant. And this means that the alleles have a different combination than that original parent. And again, normally we expect same amount of recombinants as the same amount of non-recombinants due to crossing over. But when genes are physically close together, um, we see a lower amount of recombination between those genes. So let's look a little bit about what that means. So this is um, a figure from your text. And this is showing you if genes were completely linked and could not have any crossing over happen, you would get no new combinations of allele pairs. So you would never get big M, little d, or little m, big D. Right? So all the chromosome combinations would look just like the parents. Most genes can assort independently to some degree. Okay. So if it was completely unlinked, which is what we've been looking at, you would expect all these different combinations of gametes, and again, you'd expect them in a one to one to one ratio, and the progeny you would expect to be 25%, 25%, right? And I should, guess I should back up. We are always doing these with a test cross, which means a homozygous recessive as the second parent. So test cross are used to determine gene linkage. So what we're really asking about is for this parent, are we getting recombination or are the genes linked at all? And remember a test cross, we use that homozygous recessive because one, it doesn't affect phenotype. It allows the phenotype of um, the organism we're testing to show. And we did this to determine if something was homozygous dominant or heterozygous. 
The other important thing to note is that there's no change in allele combination even if there's crossing over. You can only get little m, little d. So the test cross is also not affecting the combination of recombinant, non-recombinant progeny. Um, all right. So again, just to reemphasize, recombinants mean we have a new allele combination compared to the parent, compared to pre-crossing over. So when I say parent, I'm really meaning pre-crossing over. <coughs> the non-recombinants we also call parental because they look just like the original chromosomes. So what this is showing you is with linked genes, here's our progeny, we are not getting a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio. Right? You added these numbers up, it's 123, and so you would expect about 31 in each category if it was a sorting independently, which is what we've been working with. But in fact, you don't get that at all. You get a very low number of recombinants. So what does this tell us? The recombinant progeny can tell us something called a recombination frequency, which tells us how close the genes are. And a key word here is relatively. So we are not measuring actual distances from recombination frequency, but we're getting relative distances. And so what you do is you look at the recombinants and you take the total number of recombinants, so 8 plus 7, divided by the total number of progeny, which is 55 plus 53 plus 8 plus 7, all of them together, and you do that division and you get 12.2. So we say 12.2 is our recom oops, recombination frequency, and it's written as a percent. Recombination frequency is also the same as map units. And can also be called, oops, Centi Morgans, um, after the scientist who figured this all out, we are going to use map units. Okay, again, this is a relative. This does not say anything about how many nucleotides or base pairs the distance is. They're not saying exactly where it is on the chromosome. It's just relative. And the smaller the number, I guess I should have put this time at 100%, the smaller the number, the closer the genes are. Unlinked genes unlinked genes would have a recombination frequency close to 50%, right? Because you would expect 31 here and 31 here and 31 here and 31 here and 62 divided by 124 is 50%. So if genes have a very large recombination frequency that indicates that they're unlinked. And it could mean, unlinked could mean, again, like back here, on the same chromosome or on different. So these both would have recombination frequency 
approximately 50%. That would indicate independent assortment. So you can, I want, expect you to be able to determine recombination frequency given a data set. Or if I said something like, this cross produced 15% recombinance, what number of progeny would you expect? Okay. So, if you have 15% recombinance, or if I said they are 15 map units apart, same thing, you would say, I predict that I'm going to have 7.5 recombinants because in this 15% there are two types of recombinants possible. And the parentals would make up that other 85%. So 100 minus 15 is 85, and again, there's two parental types. So you would expect, if we had a nice round number of 100 progeny, you would expect about 42 to be one parental uh, genotype, 42 to be the other parental, 7.5 to be one recombinant, 7.5 to be the other. So those really, those numbers are coming in here. These are a little lower because they only had a 12.2% recombination frequency, right? So you can go from number of recombinants to recombination frequency to map units and vice versa. Map units to recombination frequency to expected progeny. So that's a little fun math to do. But there's something else that contributes to this. And this is this concept that if you have a dihybrid, we don't know how the chromosomes, uh, sorry, how the alleles are lined up on the chromosome. Okay? Are they big R, big L on one, and the little R, little L on another? Or they could be big R, little L, and little R, big L. And before, we haven't cared because everything is a, uh, assorting independently, and so you get this recombinance and you get the same looking parental as recombinants. But now that we're getting something different, we're getting less crossing over because the genes are linked, we want to know if the genes are in what we call coupling, or I call them cis, which means same, which means both dominant alleles are on one chromosome, both recessive alleles are on another, or if they're in repulsion, which I call trans, which means opposite, which means you have one dominant, one recessive allele on a chromosome, and one recessive, one dominant allele on the chromosome. And you might say, who cares? Well, the reason it matters is when you don't have 100% crossing over because the genes are linked, the cis and trans affects the offspring number. So I want you to take some time and look at this figure from your textbook. Because what is it is showing you is that if the alleles are in cis, and remember we're always doing a test cross, 
And because it doesn't matter if crossing over happens here regularly or not, we kind of ignore the test cross organism. So we're looking at our dihybrid. Oops. And if you do not get recombination, this chromosome and this chromosome are going into gametes. And when you do get recombination, so I'm doing crossing over, you get P plus plus little b and P plus B plus. P and B plus, that didn't make sense. Do you see how they're different? Let me see if I can, uh, of course when I want to zoom in, I can't. Yeah, right. So, um, the recombinants are always at a lower frequency. So in this case, when the genes, um, when the alleles are in cis configuration, the offspring, the majority of them, have the phenotype of the parents. Crossing over happens less, so you get less new combinations of alleles, therefore less new combinations of phenotypes. On the other hand, if the genes are in trans, or repulsion, okay, so we're starting out with genes that have the dominant and recessive um, on opposite sides, then the recombinants now are going to be looking like cis, right? You have both wild type on one chromosome, both mutant on one chromosome, and what that means is that the recombinants look like the parents. Because remember, we've got dominant recessive going on here. So here, the parents are showing dominant, and the test cross is showing recessive. Here, you don't get the dominant phenotype unless you get crossing over, unless you get both dominant or wild type alleles on the same chromosome. So you can tell if the genes, if the alleles are in cis or trans based on the recombinant progeny. We're going to work through um, a couple problems. So here's the first one. In this snail, you have autosomal allele causing a banded shell to an unbanded shell and colors yellow and brown. And you have a banded yellow snail is crossed with a homozygous brown unbanded. The F1 are crossed, and let's figure out what's happening. So take a minute and read this, and then when we go to the next slide, the first thing we're going to do is assign alleles, because you know what? I do not want to have to work with BBBO, CY, CBUW. So I'm going to make it easy for me. I'm going to say U, capital U is unbanded because that's dominant and that's how my brain works. And little u is banded. And remember I told you, you can redefine alleles as long as you tell us what you're using. So if you're not going to use these uh, genotype, or uh, yeah, gene or allele designations, you're going to use A and B, or in this case I'm going to use U and B, you need to let us know what how you're defining them. So I'm going to use big B for brown and little b for yellow. Alright, so I have a banded yellow snail. So I have a banded ooh, that's not gonna work. I have a banded, I'm going to put little things in here, yellow snail that I'm going to cross with a homozygous brown unbanded. So it's unbanded and it's brown. So what do the chromosomes look like? So in this case, I'm going to have to make my U's really big, right? 
Probably not the best letter to pick. Okay. That's what my chromosomes look like from these two parents. And I cross them and I get an F1, F1, which you know is big U, little u, big B, little b. But what do the chromosomes look like? So basically, I'm going to take one chromosome from this parent and one chromosome from this parent. And remember that these are called cis, right? Because all the recessive are on one chromosome, all the dominant are on another. So the um, question goes on to say that, oh, oh, no, it's not good. Okay, the F1, so my, this guy, which is also my, this guy is crossed with a banded yellow snail, right, a test cross. So it's U, U, B, B, right, that's what the chromosomes look like. What results of the test cross, what will the results of the test cross be if the loci assort independently? So this is what we have been doing, okay? And so what would you expect? You would expect to get little u, little u, little b, little b, big u, ah, little u, big b, little b, and then your recombination little u, little u, big b, little b, and big u, little u, oops, little b, little b. Okay, so the same thing, u, u, b, b, oops, <laughs> that would not work, u, u, b, b, right, and you could do your little Punnett square, here's your gametes for this guy and your one gamete for that guy. Okay, And we'd expect these at a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. But now we're going to say, oh, these loci are 20 map units apart. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the recombination frequency is 20 percent. That tells us that each parent, or let's do that first this way, each recombinant is going to make up 10 percent of the progeny, and each parent is going to make up 40 percent. Now, I want you to think about, pause the lecture for a minute, and tell me what do the chromosomes look like for these progeny? So hit pause. I'm going to do it. Come back. So what I'm doing is I'm writing, first I'm writing the parents' genotypes, right? Because one is going to look like this parent, one set is going to look like this parent, and then the other one, so we've got this one gone and this one gone, is going to be the new recombinants. Little u, little u, big b, little b, and big u, little u, little b, little b. Okay, now I'm going to erase this so I have some room over here. So what can I predict about the actual chromosomes? So the parents... Oops, let me do this. One parent, this parent, everybody's getting their little u, little b from the test cross parent. Right, so let's just give everybody a little u, little b. I'm going to have enough room here. Okay. So those guys are gone. 
Now this parent, the other chromosome, is going to have big U, big B, right here. Give myself a little more right here. This parent is going to get that chromosome. The recombinants Oops. Uh, so I'll make it darker. The recombinants are going to be this new combination. So little u, big B, plus one of these. Little u, little b. And this one is going to get, let's just do another color, this combination of Big U, little b, oops, I forgot my other little pair, U, little b, little b. Alright, I did it. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Didn't draw it on the chromosome. So it's going to be, that's what I was doing, this with one of these chromosomes, little u, little b. So what could you tell me about these? These are in cis, right? Dominant, dominant on the same chromosome. Recessive, recessive on the same chromosome. So a lot you can do with some recombination frequency information. All right, let's do another one. So we have dihybrid is crossed on a test cross, and this is what we get. So what I first do is I immediately go, okay, the recombinants are always the smallest number. These are recombinants. These are parentals. Because we're doing a test cross, everybody is getting a little AB from the test cross parent. So I'm going to show you my trick. I go through and I cross these out. So I'm saying everybody gets a little B from the test cross, Everybody gets a little a from the test cross. What I have left is the gene or allele combinations from the parent. So this parent, let's go here, is big A, little b. And then we know the other allele comes from the test cross. And this second parent is little a, big b, and little a, little b. Okay. So the parents are in trans. Got that? So in this case, we don't have any phenotype information. We just have genotype information. What's the recombination frequency? Well, it's 5 plus 5 over 45 plus 45 plus 5 plus 5, which luckily for me is 10 over 100, which is 10%. And what does that also tell you? That gene A and gene B are 10 MAP units apart. All right, cool. So now we've been able to figure out recombination frequency, map units, if the alleles are in cis or trans. What other fun stuff can we do with recombination frequencies and map units? We can build what we call a genetic map. Now, this is a genetic map based on crosses and recombination frequency so based on progeny. This is a relative map. Okay, These are not actual units. Map units, again, do not equal you know, 100 nucleotides or anything like that. It's a relative map based on genetic crosses. And it tells you kind of how close and how far things are. So it says the distance from A 
to B is 5 map units. I don't want to do purple. And it tells us the distance from B to C is 10 map units. So it could be B to C is 10, or it could be B to C is 10, right? You don't know until it tells you the distance between A and C is 15. So if C was over here, A, uh, A to B is 5, B to C is 10, A to C is 15. So we know C is furthest from A, B is in the middle. Now, you could write it as C to B, 10, to A, 5. These are both correct based on the information you have. So let's go with my A, B, C. We're going to add another gene pair. Oops, I forgot what it is already. A, 5, B, well, let me write the numbers up here. And C. I'm do that. Ah! <laughs> Alright. So now I've got some more information. From A to D is 8. From B to D is 13. And from C to D is 23. So C to D is the biggest distance. So you could have D all the way out here, but then D would be 33 from B and 38 from A. And that's not going to work with these numbers. So that tells us, oops, and you know, I'm trying to erase, that C to D, which is 23, D's over here, and let's see if that works. If A to D is 8, 8 plus 5 is 13, plus 10 is 23, that one works, that one works, and B to D, 8 plus 5 is 13, that one works. So now I've just drawn a genetic map or a linear map. of how these genes are relative to one another on the chromosome. So what I have left for you is, oh no, oh yeah, I forgot. I have a fun one, I have a super fun one. What if I gave you this? Would you just start to cry? I hope not. This really is actually a pretty easy one if you know how to tackle it. So let me tell you how to tackle it. All right. What do we know about these big old 50% recombination frequencies? It tells us the genes are not linked. It tells us the genes are pretty far apart. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to look at all the genes that are not linked. So for instance, A is not linked to B. And A is not linked to C. And I'm going to cross these off as I go. And A is not linked to E. And A is not linked to F. So right now I have A and D are linked. And so do you see how I'm putting the ones that are not linked into a different group? Kind of like we did with complementation groups. But now we're doing linkage groups. Okay. So I go down here and I say B and D are not linked. And if I look up here, I know A and D are, so I'm going to put A and D in a linkage group. And B and F are not linked. Oops, I put F in a group with B, so I need to move him to a different group. B and G are not linked. And if I look up here, A and G are pretty close, so I bet you they're in a linkage group. C and D are not linked, which I already have that right here. I know that. C and F are not linked. Well, I know that because I put F in its own group. C and G are not linked. Yep. D and E are not linked. Yep. D and F are not linked. Yep. 
E and F are not linked, and E and G are not linked. Oh, sorry, E and G and F and G. All right, so I've got some linkage groups here. Now let's go and map. So I know that A and D and G, let me change pen colors, look to be in a linkage group. So I have A and D and A and G. Right. And A and D are 12 map units apart. And A and G are 8. So I'm just going to guess G might be here. So well, I can always erase what I don't want to erase. These are 12. This is, I didn't draw that very well, did I? This is 4. And I look over here, and D and G are 8. And that works just fine. So I have A, G, and D in a group. And now I'm going to look at B, C, and E. Okay. So let's start with the biggest one. C and E are 26 map units apart, right? I gave you recombination frequency, but you know it's the same as map units. Okay, where's my next? Okay, B and E are 18. So I'm going to say this is 18, and this is B, and I double check. Uh-oh, B and C are 10. Well, 10 plus 18, as far as I can remember, does not equal 26. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is as genes get further apart, right, larger recombination frequencies, larger distances, the accuracy of the map units decreases. Okay, so this is not as accurate a number as when we have small, tight recombination frequencies. And that's because sometimes you can get double crossovers between genes. So it's not just that the C and B are crossing over, but the C and B and E might be all crossing over, and that kind of messes up our calculations. This is something you see in three-point crosses, which we're not going to do this semester, because I want to move on to the molecular genetics, and it's just kind of another fun math problem, but you may have felt like you've had enough fun math problems so far. So I just want you to know that sometimes the numbers don't match up perfectly. They should be close, so 26, 28 is fine. When you have small numbers, they're going to work, whoops, even better. Oh, and I left myself a whole other slide to do this, and look at that, I got it done. So, you can now take recombination frequencies or map units and make genetic maps or chromosomal maps that show the relative distance between genes. Not absolute, not where they are in the chromosome, just how close they are based on their recombination frequency. All right, so I have a couple problems for you to do, to work on, and we will go through these in class on Wednesday. Thanks.